All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, hopefully, in virtual land, you can hear me. Next we can, up. Ed. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, we have Dan Reese and Mark Castle talking about fire and fuel management with the Forest Vegetation Simulator, FVS. Take it away, Dan. All right, um, I'm going to start this off. I'm just going to kind of lead in with some demonstrations that Mark will do with FPS. But when we originally planned this, uh, we definitely wanted to make that link between foresters and fire managers. And perhaps I'm biased, but I think silviculture is that link. Um, silviculture and fuel breaks, to me, are almost synonymous. But um, so I'm going to give you an extremely quick crash course in silviculture. I dusted off my uh, forestry handbook and my college textbook about silviculture and fuel breaks. So here's some definitions that you can see on the screen of what silviculture is. When I went through college, basically silviculture is the art and science of growing trees. And there's some other definitions there. If you're an ecologist, you can say it's applied forest ecology. Uh, fuel breaks, basically where do the two merge? You're manipulating trees for the benefit of people. Fuel breaks instances for wildland fire management. Um, silviculture is for growing the forest for the landowner's objectives. And some key elements of silviculture. Uh, of course, landowner objectives. Why are you doing the action you want to do on the land? And what is the future outcomes? And where do you need to schedule plan uh, events? for maintenance or just to ensure that you're achieving the goals of the landowner objectives. That's probably one of the key elements and applies to fuel breaks also. We just don't build them and they stay like that in perpetuity. Um, we have to ensure that we go in the direction of the landowner objectives. So in silviculture, you're gonna look at site conditions, you know, the climate of the site, uh, slope, aspect, things like that. And then you're going to collect stand data. What is existing on the site? Species composition, um, stem density. Then you're going to go back and analyze that data. And you're going to project that forward with the landowner objective. So what do the options look like out in the future? Maybe you're going to go 20 years out or 50 years out. What's the volume going to be on that stand? Um, species composition. And does that fulfill the landowner objectives? And then the final. Um, portion, which we all probably need to be better as documentation. So documenting the current stand conditions, documenting uh, what actions were taken at that time, uh, when maintenance options or uh, stand exams need to be done, and then are you meeting the landowner objectives? So that, particularly in the boreal system, you know, we can be out 100 years, that the people who proceed us have an idea of why we did what we did and what our thought process was to achieve those landowner objectives. And some silvicultural systems. There's a lot of them. I just kind of threw in some of the main ones here. Basically, on the uh, right hand side of the screen, you want to make a new stand. So new, new trees are going to occupy that stand. You might, there's even age systems, uneven age systems. So an even age system, generally what we deal with in the boreal system, clear cuts, seed trees, delta woods, uneven age, you know, we're just looking at selection methods. We don't have a lot of that in the boreal system. Other systems in the US, that is what predominantly is done. And then if you want to modify the existing stand, you're basically looking at iteratives of thinning. And we give them all sorts of different names. There's release cutting, crown thinning, low thinning, what does that mean? Crown thinning, those are big trees. Low thinning, those are little trees. So which trees you're taking out of the stand, mechanical thinning or geometric thinning? Um, selection, like, well, maybe I really want to remove spruce, but I want to retain my hardwoods. Things like that. And that's certainly where wildlife um, incentive or uh, objectives can fall into that. Maybe you want to retain a certain percentage of trees that have qualities for um, cavity nesting birds, and so you could retain that in your stand condition. Like I said, there's a lot of them. It's 
basically limited only by your creativity unless you want to call it. And regeneration, another, you know, what is the future of that stand going to be? You're going to get regeneration if you want it or not. So some of these large fuel breaks we have, we might not want regeneration. So how are you going to manage for that? But you have seeding, either seed that uh, comes into the site um, or seed that you introduce to the site. Uh, are you going to plant the site and you rely on coppice or sprouting, which are species that stump sprout, or root sprout? And then site preparation. Um, do you need to do an action on that site in order to encourage or discourage uh, that regeneration? All right, well, the first part of the presentation is multi word. So <laughs> we'll move on to the picture side. Um, see if I can figure out advanced slides now. Okay, got the advanced slide part. Um, all right, so I threw in some pictures here of, of the common fuel breaks that are done in um, the boreal portions of Alaska. Uh, so here we have a, a shear blade fuel break, you know, is it a clear cut or whatever you wanna call it. it. It has similar effects on the landscape. They're not exactly the same. But um, basically, you're looking at a picture of the pictures of the process, which is clearing in the winter using a dozer. The trees are sheared off, they're pushed into piles. Generally, they're burned. And then the stand starts to go back. And so that's the bottom picture where you see some regeneration coming on the site. Slide, huh? And so here we have a picture of. Uh, a thinning or is it a shaded fuel break? Whichever you want to call it, if you're a fire person or a silver culture person. So how do you make those thinnings? Um, so you see a crew up there cutting them by hand. They make piles. They burn the piles. It's generally our process. Or you might use a small piece of equipment, grind the trees up, and then all that biomass is now on the ground. We have a question from Graham in the back. Graham's question um, was regarding black spruce regeneration. Does it regenerate without fire? Um, yes, I do see it regenerate on site. So seed that will be near the project site will seed back on the project. Um, it probably does better because black spruce is semi serotonous to have fire, but I definitely see seeding back on um, clearing. Uh, next slide. Huh? All right, and then regeneration. Uh, the picture in the upper right is a, a thinning with a lot of spruce coming back in the understory, which kind of addresses what Graham just asked. So, you know, we're getting ready regeneration back. When does that spruce need to be addressed from a, either a maintenance perspective um, or in your silvicultural prescription? You know, you might want to talk to your fire behavior anal analysis. So you would go back and perhaps remove that spruce. Um, the lower picture where you can see the mountains on there, that's a large um, shear bladed fuel break that's regenerating back into hardwoods. Uh, shading out grass, in that instance, that fulfills the objectives that we were shooting for in that, but if you don't want trees to come back, how are you gonna manage for that site? Um, picture in the upper left that has the kind of a dark side on the right, and the lighter colored side on the left, that's a, basically a massacred site of the forest was done on the right, and then, excuse me, on the left, and then on the right was your uh, shear blade. And so you can see the difference in what putting all that biomass on the ground can affect regeneration. The woody debris generally inhibits regeneration. And whether you want that or not, and how you're gonna deal with that. And then should you scarify, you can see a dozer with um, doing some scarification on a site where we actually have 
permafrost and our object there was to convert the black spruce site to hardwoods by um, driving the permafrost lower and encouraging hardwood seeding on that. How do we know that work? works? Um, look at abandoned farmlands in the area of Delta Junction. You know that conversion works. Look at the UAF ag fields. You know that conversion works. So on certain sites where your soils allow it, you can do site conversion. And then my final slide here before we turn it over to Mark, um, I just wanted to show there's a wildfire in 1999 that uh, basically slammed into Fort Greeley, which is just south of Delta Junction. And then you can see the after effects there from the air. So that's kind of a combination of all your fuel break management efforts. Um, there was a shaded fuel break uh, around that community where the fire hit. Because of that shaded fuel break, firefighters were allowed to work closer to the fire and protect the structures. And then because of the design that the military installation is probably your ultimate firewise community. Um, all those three elements work together and that's really how we want to manage fire. So it, it isn't just fuels management, it's also providing for wildland firefighters to get in there and do their job. And your values at risk are um, basically firewise. So that's my final slide and I can do questions, I guess, at the end, and we'll roll into Mark Castle. He's going to present with us virtually. Um, he works for the U.S. Forest Service, and he's going to go through a demonstration for the new Alaska variant of the Forest Service's Forest visual, um, Vegetation Simulator. And we're basically going to look at a stand data from the Kenai Peninsula, and he's going to run through some scenarios for us and explain what FDS is. I think it's an exciting tool for um, fire managers and foresters to work with planners and land managers as a way to visualize stand, visualize the stand, what it looks like, and to look at stand properties and project them into the future. So it's like, well, what is this going to look like 20 years from now? And this is what a, an estimation of what that'll be. So we're going to have to turn it over to Mark. I guess you'll have to start sharing screen. All right. Thanks, Dan. Can you hear me all right? Yes, we can hear you. All right, cool. Can you see me? I have my camera on right now. Uh, not on our screen. Okay. We'll work on that. I could. I could see you. Okay, cool. Well, I'll go ahead. So thanks, Dan, and uh, thanks for inviting me. So I'm Mark Castle. I work for the Forest Vegetation Simulator staff, which is encompassed in the Forest Management Service Center out of Fort Collins, Colorado. Um, I realized my, the biography I provided for myself wasn't very descriptive when I looked at others for this, pre uh, for this conference. So um, I've been on the staff for five years. Um, I'm originally from Virginia. I got my bachelor's of science in geography at James Madison University in 2012. And then I switched gears over to forestry and got my master's of forest resources at the University of Maine in 2017. And after that, I got the job in FDS. So that's just a little bit about me. So I'm going to turn off my video and attempt to share my screen. All right. So can you see my screen all right? Should see a PowerPoint. Not yet. OK. Maybe I did something wrong. There it is. All right. <laughs> awesome. So today I'll be giving you an overview of the forest vegetation simulator. And we'll walk through an example of how you can do fire and fuel management. We'll be doing with this with a black spruce stand, as I'll get into a bit later. So just a brief outline for today. I'm basically going to give you a quick overview of what FES is and the Alaska variant. I'll then introduce you to the fire and fuel extension of FES, which is the mechanism or tool that you can use to basically conduct fire and fuel management within the forest vegetation simulator. You can see how fires affect the stands that you're simulating and ultimately you can um, examine fire hazard over time. 
And to tie all of that together, the third component of this presentation, I'll basically be showing you an example of how you can assess fire hazard across different fuel management alternatives using a black spruce stand. All right, so just a little bit about the organization I work for, which is the Forest Management Service Center. Um, we're a substaff of the USDA Forest Service National Forest System Forest Management Staff. Um, basically, the, the big overarching goal of our staff is basically we support timber sales, contracting, and forest planning within the Forest Service. But we also kind of more than of the nitty gritty in terms of what we do, we provide mensuration, statistical and modeling skills to the Forest Service and partners. So we work, we support people doing work in the Forest Service, but we also work with pretty much anyone else, other governmental agencies, people in industry, as well as people in university and more academic settings. So, <clears throat> In the Forest Management Service Center, there's essentially two groups. There's the Forest Products Measurements Group. And um, basically this group's more in charge with um, overseeing the National Cruise suite of software, which is basically used for doing timber cruising, scaling, volume, biomass estimation, and area determination. You may be familiar with some of these folks. Ken Cormier is the group leader. Matt Oberly and Yingfeng Wang are also on that staff as well. And then there's the forest um, vegetation modeling group, which is us, and we maintain and support the forest vegetation simulator, which is a nationally supported framework for <clears throat> growth and yield modeling. And let me switch my pointer settings so you can see my mouse a little bit better. So now I'll talk a little bit about FVS, introduce you to what it is. We could spend, honestly, weeks talking about it. Some of you in the audience, I think, have, were in the training that we had for Alaska a few weeks ago. It's a big program, but I just want to talk more about our software at just a high level. So it helps to start basically with the origins of FVS, how it all began, and basically the origins of our software can be traced back to the 1970s. Um, at this time, there are kind of a wide range of yield tables, local simulators that were used in simulating forest development over time. And, you know, they represented small geographic areas, the, you know, methodologies that they used for projecting forest resources across time, I mean, differed in terms of the models that was being used. And they didn't really have a consistency in terms of the output that they produced. So given kind of the, the range of tools that were out, out there, the Forest Service's national office embarked on a goal of establishing a national growth and yield modeling framework. So that was in the 70s. And during this time, um, there's a researcher by the name of Al Stage who worked up in the Inland Empire region, which is basically northern Idaho, <clears throat> eastern Montana, and or excuse me, western Montana, and um, eastern Idaho. And he developed a growth and yield modeling framework called Prognosis. And basically, the idea of Prognosis is that it's a growth and yield model, and it takes forest inventory, you know, that's collected in the field using common inventory methods. The software projects trees forward in time using statistical relations that are developed on a um, species specific basis. And the underlying equations and modeling frameworks essentially take into consideration in terms of the predictions of growth, the stand conditions that trees reside in, management practices um, such as thinnings that you may be executing during a simulation and also considers ecosystem processes such as insect and disease as well as fire. And ultimately what happens is prognosis grows your trees out and during your simulation time frame, it basically produces stand level output. So it'll produce, met, you know, calculations of the volume in your stand, metrics of density, and other metrics that we'll talk about a little bit later as we move further into the PowerPoint. So the National Office in the Forest Service took note of prognosis and chose it kind of as the national growth and yield modeling framework that um, they wanted to move forward with. And over time, um, 
<clears throat> the timber management unit, which was the predecessor of the forest management service center, along with regional staff and members in research basically developed variants of prognosis. And there are now 20 variants of prognosis and these all comprise what is called FVS or the forest vegetation simulator. And what our staff does today is we continue to develop, maintain and support FVS. So a lot of the work that we do basically entails maintaining all the underlying code that's used to produce this software. We continue to develop the underlying models and we provide support. So there's a couple components to this. We have a help desk that you can contact. If, you're, if you are using the model, you can contact us with you know, questions on troubleshooting the model or if you want assistance um, with projects that you're working on, we can help you there. And we also offer trainings, typically in the winter and spring portions of the year which basically provide an overview of how you can run um, FVS. <clears throat> okay, so development is a piece of the work that we do on this staff. And we've been, do we've been doing a bit of this lately, and this has primarily been focused on Alaska. So we've been doing a lot of work with the Alaska variant. And just a little bit of background, there was, a variant of prognosis that was designed for Alaska. It was called the Southeast Alaska and Coastal British Columbia variant. And this was developed in 1985 for forest planning use. Um, so it came onto the scenes in the late 1980s. Unfortunately, um, as people used it in forest planning efforts that occurred during the 1990s and early 2000s, people were seeing that um, it had some issues um, in particular, it had limited capability of simulating uneven age stands. It also had problems simulating um, species mixtures such as Western hemlock and Sitka spruce. Basically, one of the things that was observed to happen is that Sitka spruce would always outcompete Western hemlock, um, and that was problematic. Another trend that was observed is that growth in terms of diameter, and particularly diameter growth, tended to be underpredicted. Um, as well as mortality. So there are a couple of limitations and a final limitation, which is kind of in the name of this variant, it only was, the original CPROG variant was only representative of Southeast Alaska and it did not account for all major forest types found in Alaska. So a notable limitation of this variant is that it didn't have underlying growth relationships for species prevalent in the boreal forest regions, such as your spruces and your hardwoods, such as paper birch, aspen, and balsam poplar. So starting in 2017, our staff basically underwent an effort to basically redo the Alaska variant in FES. So we wanted to address the limitations that were found with the CPROG variant. So we refit all the relationships for species that were prevalent in the coastal region, and we developed entirely new um, relationships for species that are prevalent in the boreal forest region. So we spent several years, this really started in late 2017, but then in the June of 2021, last year, our staff put together a unified Alaska variant and released this um, in the summer of last year. And this variant now recognizes 21 tree species commonly found in major forest types across Alaska. And these images you're seeing here, these are produced from within the forest vegetation software using a feature called the visualize feature, which basically takes in your inventory data um, and provides a visual rendering of the trees that are occurring on the in stands that you're simulating. And this stand here, this one to the left, this is a Western hemlock stand, and it has a mixture of Western hemlock and Sitka spruce. And this image to a right is another image from the visualized feature, and it captures, um, basically shows a forest type found in the boreal forest region. And the three species that are in here are quaking aspen, paper birch, and some white spruce, which are more in the understory here. <clears throat> so that's the new Alaska variant. Um, so 
why use uh, why use FES and the Alaska variant that's embedded within this software system? Well, it's a pretty powerful tool. There's a number of different things that you can do. And one of the strengths is that it can quickly summarize stand conditions at the time of inventory. So when you collect your inventory data, and it also you know, projects trees throughout time. So you can look at different metrics um, across a simulation time frame. So in FES, you can look at projected measures of stand density, such as basal area, stand density index, trees per acre, as well as metrics of stand size, such as quadratic mean diameter and top height. You can keep track of biomass, stand level biomass estimates, volumes, as well as carbon stocks. You can also keep track of different metrics if you're not you know, so geared towards volume or density, you can keep track of down woody debris, snags, canopy cover, and you can even define custom wildlife habitat indices and track those throughout time if you're so inclined. And you can also assess fire and insect pathogen hazard ratings. So there's a number of different things that you can keep track of. And the FES software, it produces output that's provided in tabular format as well as graphical format. And these two images shown here um, show output across a simulation time frame um, using the graphical output. So this top graph here is showing total cubic foot volume um, from the years 2022 to 2072 for five different Western hemlock stands. And this graph here shows above ground live carbon stocks for the same five stands across the same simula simulation time frame. So it's pretty robust. Um, you can look at information in graphical format and tabular format um, within the FES interface. You can also download the tabular um, output into Excel or text files if that's more aligns with your interest in um, the needs for your work. All right, so, oh, go ahead. Was there a question? Maybe I just heard something. All right, sorry about that. All right, so another um, strength of the forest vegetation simulator is it can be useful for helping develop prescriptions. You can simulate thinnings, fuel treatments and other types of management such as regeneration harvests. And later on in this PowerPoint demonstration, um, we'll be taking a look at different types of fuel treatments that you can implement within FVS. And ultimately using these two, uh, these first two features, what you can do with FVS is ultimately compare trade-offs among disciplines. So you can weigh, outcomes between various aspects such as carbon accounting, timber production, wildlife habitat, and finally fire hazard, which is something that we'll be examining later in this PowerPoint. So <clears throat> this is the last slide that I'll talk about FVS in general, and it covers what do you need in order to use FVS? Well, in general, it helps to have just some forestry background knowledge. There's definitely some terminology that you need to be aware of when you're using the software. You should be, you know, familiar with, <laughs> you know, what's the diameter at breast height measurement, total tree height, tree level measurements. You should be familiar with metrics of stand density, such as basal area per acre, stand density index, and also volume. Um, you should have knowledge in terms of the silvics of the species that you're modeling. Um, this is important when you're basically interpreting the results that FVS produces. And it's also um, important to have basically, have some general understanding of ecological principles when you're using this model. The second component is more material. FVS, basically <clears throat> the framework of the model is that it takes in inventory data that you collect within the field. So ultimately, when you download the FES software, it's not really, it comes with a training data set, which is basically just a data set that we use for our FES trainings. And it's a data set that you can use base, basically just to test the FES software when you install it. But really, the strength of this program is that it'll take in the inventory data that you collect. Basically, you put your data into a specific file format 
and you read it into FVS, and then basically you can project your inventory data that's pertinent to the land that you work with and see um, and basically track it over time. So the key components of the inventory data is that you have to have information collected for tree records on plots or stands um, within the land that you're managing. It's important to have estimates of site productivity um, for these plots. And if you do end up using FVS, there's resources that I can guide you to, which describe you know, what estimates you should be concerned with in terms of site productivity. And finally, the, the big component is you need to specify the sampling design of the inventory data that you collect. All the output in FVS is produced, basically produced on a per acre basis, and you need to make sure that you're representing your data correctly when you project it forward in time. It needs to match you know, the inventory design that you're using on the ground. And ultimately, um, you need to have the most current or at least a current version of the FVS software. Um, our software, we continue to update it. We release it in quarterly cycles. Um, you can download it for free from our website and use it. Um, so basically, there's essentially a release in the fall, winter, spring, and summer of every year. So it's just something to keep in mind of there. All right, so we'll now transition to the second component of this presentation, which will detail the fire and fuels extension of FVS. And this is the mechanism that's used to basically simulate fire and fuel management in your simulation. And just a little bit of background um, helps to know what an extension is. Basically, extensions to FVS are models that interact with FVS um, geographic variants and basically simulate the effects of various foreign ecological disturbances, such as insect and disease and fire, as we'll be um, looking at with this extension. And there are several components that are associated with this FVS extension. It's comprised of three different submodels. The first big one, um, in FFE is the snag submodel. So what you can do with this component is basically simulate snag and fuel dynamics over time. And these snags can be tracked or basically snags can be created due to natural aging and mortality that occurs in the stand. And they can also be created you know, by fires that you may choose to simulate um, in your simulations that you conduct within FVS. And this submodel will basically track these over time, snags over time break apart, they fall down and contribute to the fuel pools in your stand. And FVS has a number of different kinds of output that tracks this information. So the second two submodels are the fuel model and the carbon submodel. So the fuel submodel keeps track of different fuel pools, basically your standing fuels, your dead surface fuels that are occurring within stands. And it keeps track of these fuels in relation to management, fire, as well as fuel that's accumulated due to natural aging. <clears throat> and the carbon submodel, it's related to the fuel model. Ultimately, all the values that are produced in the fuel model are biomass estimates in terms of tons per acre. So what the carbon submodel does is basically it takes those biomass estimates estimations, applies a conversion factor to those biomass estimates to calculate the amount of carbon in your stand. And like the fuel model, it'll keep track of carbon in your standing um, standing biomass, both live and dead material, as well as for the biomass that's accumulates on the surface or on the, on the ground of your stand. And finally, there is the fire, oops, sorry about that. There is the fire submodel. And there's essentially two things you can do with this submodel is you can calculate potential fire effects. So when you're doing a simulation, you don't have to explicitly schedule a fire, but there is output and information that you can track in FVS that can tell you what would happen if a fire were to occur in your stand. 
And in addition to this, you can just flat out schedule a fire to occur in your simulation. And basically FES will predict what will happen with the fire and then project your stand forward in time after the fire occurs with updated stand characteristics that reflect your post fire conditions. And for the fire submodel, it's important to note that we we really didn't recreate the wheel with with this submodel. We're relying heavily on work that was done primarily out of the fire lab in Missoula. So there's fire behavior models that are used to, to estimate um, fire intensity along with um, the ambient conditions that are assumed for a stand, which would essentially um, pertain to the moisture levels of the fuels in your stand, the ambient air temperature, as well as wind speeds and a couple of other factors. We rely on the FOFOM or first order fire effects model to basically calculate the mortality that occurs from fires as well as fuel consumption and smoke production. So basically for the fire sub model, really what we're doing is basically linking FVS to those models that, that were produced by the fire lab um, out in Montana. So that's ultimately the engine for that sub model. So that's a bit of an overview of the fire of fuels and ex um, extension within FES. So what we'll do now is we'll consider a management scenario and um, yeah, okay. So um, what we'll be looking at here we're going to be examining a black spruce stand. So this is actually an FIA plot um, that was sampled on the Kenai Peninsula. This yellow dot is the shows the relative location of that plot in terms of where it's located geographically. And it's a black spruce stand. And this is a visual representation of the stand that's produced by the visualize feature within the FVS software. And the visualized feature, it allows you to get a sense of the species composition within your stand and also sh show the structure visually. So what you can see here is that about, you know, half of this stand is comprised of densely packed together black spruce. There's a couple of other species that you can see here, which are paper birch. And the other portion of the stand is not quite as dense um, in this quadrant up here towards the front, there's some white spruce, some smaller black spruce, as well as some seedling and hardwood seedling and saplings. And then finally, in this portion of the stand here, there's some more mature hardwood species. And in this scenario, they're balsam poplar. So what we'll do now is we'll consider a management scenario. We're going to be using this black spruce stand, and we're going to be looking at essentially looking at three different things, basically doing three different simulations, which I've conducted ahead, ahead, of, a time, ahead of time, and I'll just be showing you the outcomes. But we're going to be comparing the outcomes from three different alternatives. So we're first going to look at a no action scenario. So this stand was inventoried in the year 2016. In the no action scenario, we're going to grow out our stand to the year 2022, and then 20 years following this. So we'll be growing our stand all the way out to the year 2042. And in this first alternative, we're not going to be assuming any active management. In a second scenario with the same stand, we're going to be doing a thinning followed by a mastication treatment in the year 2022 for this stand. And what this will entail is we'll be cutting all trees less than nine inches in diameter. And then those trees will be dropped and cut down in the stand and then masticate, and then we're going to masticate 70% of the fuel that's in our stand. And then finally, we're going to be considering this last alternative here, which will be a thinning with fuels piled and burned. So this will more closely resemble a clear cut with reserves. We're going to be removing more trees and cutting all trees less than 15 inches in diameter. That'll occur in the year 2022. And then what we're going to assume is that we're going to have a pile burn where we burn 70% of the surface fuel in the stand in the year 2024. And I'll just note something too. This was just this is just an example. You can tweak, you know, the 
the size and the amount of trees that you're cutting. You can also choose how the, the amount of fuel that you want to masticate. It doesn't have to be 70%. These are just the default settings that are in FVS. You can easily tweak these to more closely resemble the management that you're doing on the ground. But this is just for the sake of example. And so what we'll be doing for all three of these scenarios is we'll be looking at FVS output to assess fuel loadings, fire hazard, and then we'll be taking a look at some of the features that can be used to assess stand conditions. All right, so in this next slide, we're gonna be looking at some of the graphical output that's produced from what's called the FVS fuels table, which keeps track of different fuel pools or loadings in your stand throughout the simulation time frame. We'll be doing this using the graphics option and <clears throat> the image you're seeing on the left here corresponds to all the standing fuel, both live and dead in the stand. It's reflected in terms of tons per acre and you're seeing it across the simulation time frame, which is running from 2016 to the year 2042. And this image to the right, <clears throat> We're looking at surface fuels, so the, um, so the, this is the amount of dead fuel on the ground in our stand, also represented in terms of tons per acre, and is shown throughout the simulation time frame as well. So there's three different trend lines that you're seeing in this graph. <clears throat> so this first dotted line here corresponds to our no action alternative, and which can be shown on the legend here. This dark solid line corresponds to the trends for the simulation where we executed a thinning and mastication treatment. And the third dotted line, which has the smaller dashes than the no action trend line corresponds to what was happening in the run where we conducted that thinning with fuels pile and burned. So we'll start by looking at the outcomes in terms of the standing fuel across time in this first graph. And you can see that for the no action plan, it's a pretty straightforward trend. Basically, the amount of standing fuel is increasing over time. We're not cutting any trees or doing anything with this stand, just letting it grow. Trees are growing in diameter and height. They're adding on more biomass, and ultimately, your stand level biomass estimates are increasing over time. You can see here how standing fuel loads change fuel loads change for your different management alternatives. So you can see a decrease in standing fuel loads when we execute both the thinning with mastication treatment and the thinning with fuels pile and burned. For the mastication treatment, we were only cutting trees up to nine inches in diameter. So you can see that this treatment didn't remove as much of the standing fuel as the thinning with fuels pile and burned option. And just as a reminder for that latter option, we are cutting trees less than 15 inches in diameter. So you can see here that the standing fuel loads decrease more for that thinning with fuels pile and burned action. All right, so we'll jump over to the image to the right. So something else you may be interested in keeping track of is the surface fuel that's accumulating in your stand throughout time. <clears throat> and what you're seeing in this graph is total surface fuel. In FVS, you can look at basically fuels broken up into different pools based on the size of the pools. And you can look at that within our software. I just chose to look at the total just for this exercise, but you can, you can look at different um, fuel components within your stand. So we'll first explore what's happening with the no action alternative. Basically, you see a decline in surface fuels over time. It's pretty drastic from the year 2016 to the year 2022. And then there's less of a decline throughout the remainder of the simulation. And one of the dynamics that's assumed to occur with fuel in the fire and fuels extension is that it undergoes decay. So fuel will decay. It'll lose. Um, density and mass, and ultimately you won't have as much surface fuel in some components in terms of tons per acre when you look at that across time. For our two management alternatives, you can see that we're increasing the surface fuel loadings. Um, 
by the year 2022. So in both our treatments, we're felling trees. These are ending up on the floor of the stand. For the thinning with fuels pile and burned, you'll see a you see a big decrease, which occurs in the year 2024. And this is simply due to the fact that we're burning 70% of the surface fuel in our stand when we conduct um, those pile burns. And then you can see a decline here as well. And that's just simply what's sort of what was happening in our no action alternative where we had fuels decaying over time. And finally, for the mastication treatment, you can see that increase in fuel load, surface fuel loadings in the year 2022, and then a decline due to decay, which is um, more pronounced from the years 2022 to 2032, and then a little less sharp from the years 2032 to the year 2042. So you can, with this software, you can pretty quickly and concisely describe how your fuel loadings change over time. We're looking at the graph outputs for this, but you could also look at the same information in tabular format if you were interested as well. So we'll jump over to a different category of variables, and we'll be looking at two different metrics of basically fire hazard. And the metrics that we'll be looking at are produced in what's called the potential um, fire table. So we didn't explicitly schedule fires to occur in these simulations. What we did is basically use the feature of the fire submodel within the fire and fuels extension to look at kind of that what if scenario, you know, over time, what is the fire hazard over a time if a fire was to occur at during a given year. So the first variable that we'll look at or first image I should say is this one on the left and on the y axis we're looking at total flame length and on the x axis we're looking at results shown across the simulation time frame which is again running from 2016 to 2042 <clears throat> the trend lines are exactly the same as they were in the images shown on the previous slide they correspond to our three different alternatives so you can see that if we were to do nothing and we examined our no action alternative, you can see that we would have a really large flame length. In the year 2016, we're at about a little bit under 35 feet. As the stand grows, continues to get more dense, the flame length, um, if a fire was to occur, would be expected to be quite large. And by the end of the simulation, you could have some pretty, pretty significant flame lengths of up to 50 feet in length. You can see, though, that when we implement the two different managements, our thinning with mastication and the thinning with fuels pile and burned, that the expected flame length, if a fire was to occur, sharply decreases and remains significantly lower throughout the simulation time frame that we're examining here. So basically, instead of the flame length shooting up to into the 40s and 50 foot flame length, we're bringing it to under 10 feet in length, and it remains so throughout the duration of the simulation. <clears throat> okay, so over here is a different metric of fire hazard that you can look at in FES. And what's shown on the y axis here is the percent of basal area mortality that would occur in a stand if a fire was to occur. And the three trend lines, again, correspond to our different management alternatives. So for the no action, if we were just to let this stand grow throughout time, you would have a pretty catastrophic fire. Essentially, <clears throat> nearly 100% or 100% of the stand would be expected to die to a fire if one was to break out in that stand. <clears throat> and in terms of our management alternatives, you can see that they change this relationship. You can see that for the mastication treatment, the percent basal area that would occur in the stand decreases um, down, to a, down to less than 60% of the total basal area by the year 2032. And for the thinning with fuels pile and burned, it drops down even further. We're cutting down more trees um, and basically the amount of mortality that would be expected to occur basically is a little bit above 40 by the year um, 2032. 
20, uh, 2032. You do see a rebound occurring in terms of potential mortality that could occur for both um, for both of these management alternatives. And the reason that this is occurring is that FVS and the Alaska variant, there's a regeneration model that's operating underneath the scenes. And the regeneration model predicts periodic ingrowth that occurs throughout time. And it also predicts larger regeneration events to occur after disturbances such as harvests and fires. So you see the risk of fire increasing as that re regeneration comes into your stand. And I'm not gonna go into this for this presentation. There are ways you can tweak the amount of regeneration that enters your simulation following disturbance. If you executed a treatment that, you know, basically did some site prep that didn't allow for as much regeneration to occur, there are ways that you can simulate and reduce the amount of regeneration that occurs um, in these regeneration events. So just something to note there. All right, and we'll look at one last suite of output. So something that may be of interest to you all, if you were to produce a document and show it to, you know, fellow resource, resource managers or potentially the public, um, it may help to have images that show a visual representation of what's happening in your stand when you consider different management alternatives. So we're looking at three images produced by that visualized feature for the year 2022. Um, and they show the after condition, um, the, after con the after treatment conditions in the year 2022 for the no action, the mastication treatment and the thinning and pile burn. So if we take a look at the no action, you can see that, yeah, this, the stand's pretty dense. It's the image we saw earlier. Um, you can see that for the mastication treatment, we cut a large number of trees. We did leave some black spruce standing and some of the smaller hardwoods and we left that hardwood component um, the mature hardwood component in the stand as well. And then you can see that the thinning and pile burn was a bit more aggressive. Basically, none of there's no residual black spruce or other softwood species were just leaving behind um, those larger hardwoods in the stand. So we'll look ahead to the year 2032, which shows the stand condi conditions 10 years hence. So if you take a look at the no action alternative, there's not a big change. Um, you're, you'll see, you'll notice some trees that have an orangish coloration in this image. Those are trees that are expected to die over the course of the simulation. So the stand is getting more and more dense, more background mortality and density related mortality is occurring. So you'll get some, get some associated mortality. And for the two treatment images, you can see the residual trees that were left. And then you can also see that we're having that regeneration enter the simulation. So there's that regeneration that's occurring following the disturbances in the stand, which um, were those two harvest treatments. And there's a mixture of both softwood and hardwood species entering these stands. So it's important to look at your simulation outcomes in terms of, you know, the actual consequences of your actions, look at, you know, the numbers, but it's also important, you know, to get a general understanding of visually what would happen structurally to your stand if you were to implement these different types of treatments. So these are just a few of the features um, and outputs that you can explore in FVS. There is much, much more so this was just a pretty brief introduction. So that concludes the demonstration component um, of this PowerPoint. So just a quick recap of what we've covered today of FVS. FVS is a nationally supported framework for growth and yield modeling. It's a valuable tool that can be used to evaluate stand conditions, treatment options, and different trade-offs between management alternatives across time. And the FFE extension of FVS allows for the assessment of fire hazard and effects. So that takes me to the conclusion 
of this PowerPoint. Um, I will note that if you have any more in-depth questions and you do end up using the FVS model, you can always feel free to contact me at the email address shown here. And we also have a help desk inbox where you can send general inquiry, inquiries about the forest vegetation simulator. And someone from our staff um, will answer this. So at this point in time, I'll open it up to any questions or if Dan has any add-ons that he would like to add. Thanks. All right, we'll open it up for questions. Um, anybody online, Tom will let me know if there's some questions and we'll start with some folks in the room. Uh, I'll work with Jeremy here on the team. Hey, Mark, this is Jeremy Dallas. First, uh, Thanks for doing the uh, training here a couple of weeks ago. Sorry, I missed it. Um, so appreciate you uh, taking the time to do that. And um, I have used FBS historically uh, a couple of years ago going through NASP. And uh, I knew that, there, that you guys were working on an interior, a variant that included in interior conditions. So my question is, I guess, is um, I'm assuming that, that the models that you're using for decay regeneration and um, timber growth, or, you know, the growth model, they're coming from FIA plots in South Central, is that correct? Or did you end up using some of the, uh, the data sets that came from the interior, like CAPI and, and some of the stuff that John Yari was doing at, up at UAF? Yeah, so great question. Um, we use a lot of the interior data, like those, the, the CFAI, plots, we use that. There is some data from the Department of Defense located more in the interior that we used as well. And we also drew upon FIA data that was available for, which FIA data mostly encompassed the Southeast region, but there is some as well coming online for the interior. So we use that as well. So we did use a lot of data that was collected in the interior for those growth and regeneration relationships. Now, in terms of the decay rates that you briefly touched upon, there are just default de decay rates that we basically just took um, from the FFE submodel. Those may or may not be realistic depending on where you are, but one of the features that you can basically adjust in FVS is you can specify your own custom decay rates. So if you don't really agree with the decay rates, in the FFE component that's available for Alaska, you can use keywords to adjust those default decay rates, which can be done by species. Great, thanks. Yeah, absolutely. All right, I think uh, Graham had a question. I'll put the microphone over to him. Yeah, just uh, curious if FES accounts for any variation in trees, spatial uh, patterns. Good question. So FES is, it's a distance independent model. So we're not really looking at the relationship of stems and explicitly in terms of the spatial relationship between them. It's technically a semi distance independent model. So basically when you're working with data, inventory data, FES keeps track of information by- 30 based upon inventory points that occur within your stand. So the underlying growth relationships are used, rely upon those plot level metrics. So they do capture some of that within stand variability that occurs in terms of the density that occurs in different parts of the stand as well as a tree's social position as well. Okay, Yeah. Mark, very good uh, presentation. I was curious, I was involved in some discussions about FBS before I retired in 2014, but I was wondering if the uh, 2021 publication or what you've done, does it cover uh, anything about source imagery, satellite imagery, anything that you might have used to uh, attempt to uh, classify vegetation where you didn't have stand inventory data? So we didn't do, any sort of classification or any work in terms of imagery and anything like that. We mostly, when we were building this variant, relied on inventory data that was collected. So there is 
as I mentioned earlier, there is some continuous forest inventory networks that we use to develop all the relationships. And then we also relied upon some more, I guess, static data, if you'd put it as, or data that was collected in timber inventories. We didn't do much in terms of um, classifying vegeta vegetation through imagery or anything like that. We did when we were fitting the equations, if a tree basically, or if an inventory plot didn't have elevation, slope, or aspect values, which are used in some of the underlying relationships, then we did use a digital elevation model to basically impute some of those variables where it wasn't collected in the field. All right, I think we got a question online from Darren, if you want to ask it. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thanks, Mark, for taking your time to, to go over the FBS with us. I have uh, two questions. One is, how are we, um, are we able to, to capture the increasing mortality rate from the spruce beetle? Is, is that through the, the FIA or is that like a metric that we can enter um, on our own or? Yeah, so the underlying relationships that we develop don't automatically do that. I mean, probably we're using data where, you know, that mortality is occurring in some of the stands that we, we use for fitting those relationships, but it's not explicitly characterized in the relationships that we developed. And typically what we rely on to reflect that type of mortality that occurs from insect and disease is extensions. Currently for the Alaska variant, only the dwarf mistletoe extension is active. So accounting for the effects of insect and disease is probably something that we need to enhance in the future. One thing that you can do though in FES is you can specify what are called modifiers and you can adjust growth rates and mortality rates that occur within stands. So for instance, if you have a rough idea of how much mortality did occur from you know, an event such as a beetle outbreak, you could use a modifier to kill off a certain proportion of the trees in a stand or multiple stands if you're running a multi-stand simulation to reflect some of that mortality that occurs from those disturbance events. Okay, uh, thanks. And then my second question, probably a little easier. Uh, is there any um, plans on making this web-based here in the future? <clears throat> so the, the FES software? Yes. So yeah, so I probably could have hit this better if I had done a demonstration with the software. So there's essentially two configurations that you can use um, with FES. There's a version that's entirely hosted on a server online and you can run the software off of that. Basically the software is hosted from a server hosted by Virginia Tech University. And you can run your simulations using that configuration. Alternatively, there's a version that we house on our website that you can download. And it basically is a local installation of the software and you can just run it off your machine. You don't have to be connected to an online setting. So there's two options you can work on. You can, you can work with FES online or you can run it locally on your computer as well. All right, uh, thanks, Mark. Yeah, absolutely. All right, thank you, Mark. That was a great presentation, great, great questions. I'll turn it over to Ed and uh, we'll keep it moving. Thanks.